I'm really excited because we've got Michael Francis with us. Um, his story is incredible. Um, I, I told him today that I read his wife's book just to get her perspective on some things. But I know you're going to be blessed by the conversation tonight. And so if you would, please welcome him to the stage, former captain of the Colombo crime family and now child of God, Michael Francis. Thank you. Michael, thank Thanks, you so Pastor. much. Thank you. Great to see you. Good to be here. Well, I just want to say uh, it is an honor to have you, and, uh, and I'm excited. You know, sometimes we bring guests in, and they want to be insulated from people. They, they say, hey, bring me in, but where can I, basically, where can I hide from people? And I love the fact that, that you say, hey, I want, to, I want to meet with people. I want to talk to people. And so I just want to say from the get-go, thank you. For being, um, for being available and wanting to connect with the people that are here tonight. So just so you know, Michael is going to be available following the worship experience tonight to sign books, to chat with you, take pictures, that kind of thing out in the lobby. So thank you, Michael. We'll Appreciate do it. it. Thank you. Okay, so the intro video did a great job of kind of setting some things up. But for those that don't know, your dad is an infamous figure in, um, in New York City history. Uh, he was the underboss for... Uh, for Joe Colombo, right. and um, and so, but that's not something you. I mean, you you were raised in a family where your dad was was a very important figure, but you really didn't know about that until you were a little older, did you? Well, yeah, my dad. Um, he was very very high profile. He was kind of like the John Gotti of his day. He mm -hmm. was always under investigation, always a major target of law enforcement. So I grew up in that environment. Uh, but my dad didn't want that life for me originally. He yeah. wanted me to go to school. He actually had aspirations for me to be a doctor. Yeah. That was his uh, dream for me. Um, and uh, what I really respected, many things I respect about my dad, but one thing was that in the house, we were a family, Mel. Mm -hmm. He would never bring what was going on in the outside world in the house. Sure. It's like it didn't even exist. So whatever I knew about my dad, I knew from observation, I knew from others, I knew from the media, but never from his lips. He would never talk about it. Well, and even growing up, you were around um, Joe Colombo and yeah. some other very notor uh, people with a lot of notoriety, but you never knew them in that way, really. They were just, they were just people that you knew. Uh, yes, uh, Joe Colombo was Uncle Joe, and yeah. you know, all, all my dad's uh, soldiers and associates, they were like uncles and friends, and you know, I mean, look, I knew something was different. Obviously, you yeah. could see it and observe, but I never really focused. I was an athlete in school, mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I just tried to live my life. It was difficult because my dad was constantly being arrested, and, you know, you know one thing um, that, that I make people understand is I grew up in an environment where my dad was my hero. Yeah. I loved him. He was a great father, great husband to my mother, and I always saw law enforcement as the enemy trying to hurt my dad. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in an environment where really law enforcement were the enemies, the bad people, and my dad was the good guy. And that's how, that's the mindset that I had as a kid. Yeah. Um, so your dad had this desire for you to go to, to, go to college, mm -hmm. go to med school, and that's, and you had already been accepted, haven't you, to a Hofstra, or was that just the plan? Yeah, no, it, I was a pre-med student okay. uh, at Hofstra University. Right? And so at, at that point, what shifted in your life to make you decide, okay, this road that I'm on is not the right road for me, I'm choosing another path? Well, from the time it got <clears throat> really serious with my dad, uh, when I was about four, 13, 14, he was arrested and indicted in the state for some very serious crimes. And he was, uh, they locked him up during that period, and he went to trial, <clears throat> excuse me, twice, and uh, was acquitted in the state. But then in 1966, Dad was indicted in federal court for masterminding a nationwide string of bank robberies. After a lengthy trial, he was convicted. In 1967, he was given 50 years in prison. It was actually the highest sentence uh, ever given for a conspiracy case up to that point. And, um, and then in 1970, he went off to do his time. He lost all his appeals. And uh, he was 50 years old when he went in, so I figured he had 50 on top of that. It was a death sentence. He right. would never come out of prison alive. So. I started getting very close with Joe Colombo. He kind of took me under his wing uh, as an adult now. I started to meet a lot of my dad's friends. They said, Mike, what are you doing going to school? If you don't help your father out, he's going to die in prison. Yeah. So I was very impacted by that, and I went to see dad in Leavenworth. And, uh, you know, one thing, Mel, my dad looked at me, and he said, Mike, I'm innocent of this crime. I, I'm not a bank robber. Uh, I know that the witnesses against him were, uh, they had drug issues. 
My dad had always preached to me against drugs. He never wanted that. So when he told me he was innocent, I believed him. And I felt at that point it was incumbent upon me to try to gain his release so he would die in prison. And um, I lost interest in school, and my dad said to me, if you're going to be on the street, I want you on the street the right way. And in his mind, the right way was to become a member of his life. So he proposed me uh, for membership in the family because, you know, you just can't go and say, hey, guys, I'd like to join. Right. You know, somebody has to vouch for you. I'd like you. to fill out the application. Yeah, there's, right. there's, no, uh, there's no written application. <laughs> uh, somebody has to vouch for you and, and say that you have what it takes to be a member. And so yeah. my dad proposed me into that life. Okay, so you <clears> used the phrase a couple times, the life. Uh, for those of us that are uninitiated, what does that mean? What do you, when you talk about the life, what does that, what does that look like? Well, you know, the, the, the La Cosa Nostra in this town, there really is no mafia in America. Mafia exists in Italy. In America, it's called La Cosa Nostra. It means this thing of ours. And there are similar organizations, but if you take an oath here in America to be a member of La Cosa Nostra, you're not automatically a member of the mafia in Italy and vice versa. Mm -hmm. So even though we respected, uh, you know, the people that would come over here from the mafia, we didn't share our secrets with them. Two separate organizations. But, um, you know, people often think that the mob life is a business. It's not a business. Yeah. It's a, an entire way of life. It's a whole subculture from everything else that exists. And so we refer to it as the life because it really is different. We have our own rules, our own regulations, our own policies. Uh, you know, we affect everybody around us, family, friends, people we do business with. And we do business as part of that life, but it's really a lifestyle. Well, and, and from what I've read, it looks like there's a high commitment level to each other and to... Um, to a, a certain standard of living as far as, hey, there's things we do, things we don't do, but we're committed to each other. Um, I'm going to take care of your family if something happens to you, mm -hmm. you know, your wife, your kids, you know, uh, and that kind of thing. Was there something about that that was appealing to you uh, about that? or You know, I'm going to be honest. I had a very idealistic view of that life because my dad was part of it, and mm -hmm. I loved my dad and respected him so much that um, I thought it was a good thing. Yeah. And there is, um, you know, look, when I first came into the life, I was told, you know, nobody will ever bother your mother, your sister, sure. your daughters, wherever you go in the world, you'll have friends because right. it's a worldwide organization. Um, you know, so I felt, uh, you know, I've got your back, you've got mine. Yeah. I, I don't think that there's anything more powerful than this bond, this relationship among men. And, you know, um, please don't mix up what I'm saying now, but I think Jesus showed us that with the relationship he had with his disciples at the mm -hmm. time. So I was very uh, enamored with this, you know, male relationship that we had, this honor, this alleged honor and right. respect. Um, so I came in with that point of view. So uh, you, you meet with uh, Joe and some of the other guys, and you decide, hey, I'm going to take this step into the life. Um, and you find out pretty quickly that uh, just because your dad is someone important doesn't mean that you're necessarily someone important. You've got to pay your dues. So what did that look like? Well, yeah, for the first, you know, when I first met with, uh, well, Joe Colombo had been shot and seriously wounded. He eventually died from the wounds, um, and a new boss had taken over. His name was Tom DeBella, and Tom has passed on now. And uh, when my father proposed me, I sat with Tom, and he said, Mike, I got a message from your dad. He said, you want to become a member of this life. Is that true? And I said, yes. He said, well, here's the deal. From now on, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you're on call to serve this family, the Colombo family. That means if your mother is sick and she's dying and you're at her bedside and we call you the service, you leave your mother's side, you come and serve us. From now on, we're number one in your life before anything and everything. When and if we feel you deserve this privilege, this honor to become a member, we'll let you know. So I was 21 years old, 21, 22. And I was in kind of like a, a pledge period where I had to do anything and everything I was told to do to prove myself worthy. Um, because the fact that my father proposed me doesn't mean that it's automatic that right. you become a member. You've got to prove yourself in that regard. And um, it, w it was a strenuous period in my life. So uh, what did it take to get out of that initiation period for you? What did that look like? Um, well, after about a year and a half, uh, I proved myself worthy in that regard. And look, I, I always try to be as honest as I possibly can, and it's difficult at times for mm -hmm. me to say these things, but, uh, you know, there's a lot of menial things that I had to do. You know, respect is very important. You had a meeting at 8 o'clock. You weren't there at 7.30. You were late. You can right. never be late in that life. You know, drive the boss to a meeting, sit in the car for five hours, wait for him to come out. God forbid you go get a newspaper or go to the restroom. He comes out, you're not there, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. I know I did that once, I paid, paid for it. <laughs> but, um, you know, a lot of things like that. And, you know, 
I, I say this because I want people to understand um, the power of God in my life at some point. Um, and I don't say this with any amount of pride or arrogance or anything like that. Um, but that life is very violent. Mm -hmm. And if you're part of the life, you're part of the violence. And there's no escape, Mel. Yeah. If anybody tells you differently, they're either not being honest with you or they weren't a made member of that life. And so I had to go through that period. And um, uh, then it was Halloween night, 1975, when I was called into a room. And uh, that night, I took an oath and became a sworn made member of the family. You know, one of the things, um, and I had read a number of different interviews and things like that leading up to this, but one of the things I saw that, that I, I believe you said that night, uh, you swore an oath that you were born again into this thing of ours, but uh, did they use the term born again? Yes. You know, um, I, I'll set it up for you. There were six of us that took the oath that night, and it was midnight, and the reason for that is uh, they have to make sure it's a secure place. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it was a place in Brooklyn that we went to. We were called into a room individually. The boss was seated at the head of like a horseshoe configuration, under boss and consigliere to his left and right, and then all the officials, the captains, were alongside of them. And I walked down the aisle, stood in front of the boss. I held out my hand. He took a knife right here, cut my finger. This is a blood oath. <clears throat> Some blood dropped on the floor. <clears throat> Excuse me. I cupped my hands. He took a picture of a saint, a Catholic altar card, put it in my hands, lit it aflame. Didn't hurt, it burned quickly, it was merely symbolic. And uh, what he said that night, you know, I'll never forget, I didn't realize the relevance at that point, but he said, tonight, Michael Francis, you are born again into a new life into La Cosa Nostra. Violate what you know about this life, betray your brothers and you'll die and burn in hell like this saint is burning in your hands. And that's the oath. And he said, do you accept? And I said, yes, I do. And you know, it was years later, um, when I had been speaking in a church, actually, um, uh, Jonathan Kahn, I don't know if you know who Jonathan mm. is, Beth Israel Temple, he's written a number of books, he's a biblical scholar, he was a, a, a Jew who now is a, a follower of Jesus, brilliant man, and I came off the stage after I had said this, and I had said this oath, you know, so many times, hundreds of times, <clears throat> and a, a gentleman walked up to me, and he had this look on his face, and he put his hands on my shoulder, and he said, Michael, I got to tell you something, he said, when you said that oath, I had a vision of Satan standing behind you with his hands on your shoulders, looking up at the sky and saying, I'll show you what born again means. I got one of yours. Mm. And, you know, that's when I, I realized that. I said, wow, you know, I realized that the enemy, in my view, I think biblically it, uh, I'm supported by this, um, has two functions. First one, separate us from God. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll never be forgiven. Your life is a mess. You're too sinful. I think he tries to separate us from God with so many things, negative things that we have in the world. His second function, I think, is to mock our Lord. Mm -hmm. And, you know, supported by that, by when Jesus was fasting in the uh, desert. You know, the enemy appeared to him three times. And the third time, he said, get on your knees uh, and, and praise me, and I'll give you this golden city that he put out in front of him. I believe he knew Jesus wasn't going for it. Mm -hmm. He was just mocking our God. And, um, you know, I have to say this, too. You know, that life is an evil life. Yeah. The gang life, the mob life, the mafia, it's an evil life. And I'm not calling the guys evil. I was one of them. Mm -hmm. I just happen to be extremely blessed. Um, but it's an evil life because I don't know one family of any member of that life that hasn't been totally devastated. I mean, devastated, including my own. Yeah. Now, not my wife and kids, but my, my dad... 38 years in prison, my mother 33 years without a husband. At the end, she passed away five years ago. At the end of her relationship with my dad, I can only call it ugly yeah. because she blamed him for everything that went wrong. I had a sister that died of an overdose of drugs. My brother, 25-year drug addict, is now in the witness protection program. He got himself in trouble, ended up testifying against my dad and put my dad back in prison. A son betrays a father. Yeah. My younger sister uh, died at 42 years old of cancer, and on and on and on. I'm the only one that escaped, mm -hmm. and it was only by the grace of God because, you know, I'm going to be honest with people, I'm probably the most blessed, most fortunate person that's ever going to sit here and, and talk to you about anything because had I been left up to my own to do what I wanted to do in my life and follow the path that I was on, I'd either be dead or in prison for the rest of my life. And honestly, that's what I deserved. I earned that for myself, having yeah. spent 20 years on the street every day in violation of both God's laws and the laws of man. And for some reason, you know, God uh, 
just blessed me in the way he has and, and put me out of that at life because I don't know anyone that I ran with that's alive or not in prison. Well, everybody. Uh, the, the six guys that, that uh, took the oath with you that night, where are they at now? Well, there were six of us. Um, the other five are all dead, that, yeah. and they were all murdered. Not one of them died of natural, of natural yeah. causes. So, you know, it's, uh, you know, I sometimes get a little bit of chills when I repeat it because... I don't take any day for granted realizing how blessed that I have been in my life. Yeah. I have bad days, don't get me wrong, but, but I know that uh, every day for me is, uh, is a blessing. So after you, you took the oath um, there with, with the other guys that were in the room, what changed at that point in, in, in your life with the, the... Well, you know, when I came in, I was motivated to do two things. Number one, get my dad out of prison. I did get him out. By the way, my dad did 38 years total of the 50, which is maximum under the old law with the feds. He maxed out with good time. Uh, he was in and out five times, each time on a parole violation and each time for associating with another felon. He always thought he was being covert. They would surveil him and they locked him up five times. Wow. Um, but I did get him out after 10 years. And uh, just as an aside, my dad today is 101 years old. Yes. He, he was released from prison last June, and at the time of his release, he was the oldest inmate in the country. And he's right now the oldest living made man in America. He's been part of this life for over 68 years ago, he took yeah. the oath. So he goes back Crazy. to the days of Luciano and all that stuff. But, um, so I did get him out of prison, and um, secondly, I wanted to make money. My dad said in this life you make money, it translates to power, not unlike the real world. So. I was fortunate, Mel. I knew how to use that life to benefit me in business. Yeah. I had a little head for business. I was very aggressive, and uh, I went on to make a very significant amount of money. And when that happens, you know, you rise in the ranks. And in 1980, uh, after five years as a soldier, because you come in as a soldier, uh, the boss of my family, who's now doing life in prison, uh, he said, Mike, you're doing a great job, and he appointed me a cop regime, or captain. Mm -hmm. And from 1980 until 95, when I consider myself formally removed, I operated in that capacity. So um, from 1980, really the early 80s, there started to be a little bit of shift in you. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, and I've read several places that there was just some subtle things that were starting to happen maybe within you mm -hmm. that, that you realized maybe a shift was happening. What was going on in you that... that you think was bringing that about? Well, you know, when I look back, I, I understand it now. I didn't understand it then, but I think, you know, when you finally enter into this relationship with Jesus, which is what our life is all about, it's mm -hmm. a relationship with Jesus, and you look back in your life, you kind of see the steps that were planned for you, I yeah. believe. And, um, you know, part of things, Mel, I was making a, a, a tremendous amount of money. You know, I had devised a scheme to uh, defraud the government out of tax on every gallon of gasoline. I had all the Russian mob guys were, were my partners, and we were bringing in almost $10 million a week. And, uh, you know, that went on for and seven years. What year years. was that? Because that's a lot of money today, but what year was that happening? Like? That was, uh, I started that in uh, seven, late 78, 79. So we're right. talking like 1980 money, you were making up to $10 yes. million a week. yes. And I had, uh, I had a jet plane, I had my own helicopter, I had a house in Florida, a house in New York, a house in California. I had 300 guys under me, you know, ready to do anything I tell them to do. I had two automobile dealerships, I had a big uh, leasing company, I had... Uh, and, and some of those companies were legit companies. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So, I mean, it wasn't... You, have a, you, had, you had a mind for business, and some yeah. of the business just happened to be illegal. That's correct. <laughs> I mean, you know, look, we all did the standard things. Like I was, I had a number of bookmakers, uh, yeah. that, you know, that worked under me. I had 12 or 13 guys. I had, um, I was lending money out at usurious rates. Mm -hmm. Everybody does that. I had a little numbers business. I mean, that's just kind of standard stuff that you do. Never involved in drugs. Mm -hmm. We weren't allowed to be involved in drugs in our family. If we did, we, we, we got killed, basically. And I hate anything to do with drugs, Mel. Yeah. I mean, I, it was, it was a, a terrible part of my family life. Um, but um, so I was making a tremendous amount of money. And honestly, with that, it's kind of a double-edged sword. I was one of the younger guys. There's resentment at times, you know. So you're always kind of watching your back and being careful about what you do because you know there's a lot of treachery in that mm -hmm. life. And um, there was an incident one night that I had that um, my dad actually betrayed me. And 
it, it, uh, I can only describe it, it just, it just cut like a knife mm -hmm. in me. And because I said, man, if, if this life can separate me and my dad, what do I really have here? Yeah. But I never said anything. You know, I never said a word to him. I just, because in that life too, you don't talk much. You file mm -hmm. things away and you just remember and you watch yourself from that point. Um, but I know that I say this, and you'll understand as we get into this a little bit more, I believe with all my heart that that had to happen in my life because I had such an idol, idolization for my dad yeah. that I think God at that point in time, I didn't know it, he had to break that tie I had with my father. Yeah. Because if that incident didn't happen, I would have never walked away because hmm. I could have never felt that I was betraying him. But um, it was an important night in my life when that happened. So um, 1984, you were producing a movie and mm -hmm. you met a girl who was, who was in the film, um, Camille Garcia. Mm -hmm. And uh, just tell me about a, just kind of a snapshot. What did that look like and what happened then after... I'm you producing a movie. I had a, I had a production company, and Smokey Robinson was a dear friend, so he came to me with a screenplay for a breakdance movie. You know, mm -hmm. that breakdance was big in the 80s. A lot of music, dance, yeah. a lot of rap music, but that's when you can listen to rap music on the radio, not like today. Forget about this stuff today. <laughs> but back then, you know, it was old school rap. We had the Sugar Hill Gang, Curtis yeah. Blow, Run DMC, old school rap. So I the said... Fat, the Fat Boys were in that movie. The Fat they? Boys were in the movie, yes. Fat Boys are old school. Smokey was in the movie. Yeah. Yeah, it was all that stuff. Yeah. And so uh, we, we filmed it in Florida, and uh, we brought cast and crew from L.A. to work in the film and 50 or so professional dancers. And we had just finished pre-production. Um, uh, I had everybody staying in a hotel in South Florida, and I threw a party for everybody on a Sunday afternoon because Monday we were starting principal photography, the heavy work. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting by the pool, minding my own business, talking to a few guys, and all of a sudden this gorgeous girl comes out of the water, and I saw her, and it was... Everything went in slow motion. It was like a Pepsi commercial, right? And, <laughs> and um, I said, wow, you know, who is this girl? And, and uh, she looked like a dancer to me. So I asked the choreographer, I said, hey, uh, Jeff, is that one of your girls? He said, yeah. I said, bring her over. I want to meet her. So she kind of figured, oh, big shot producer, she'll want to meet me. Why not? So she comes over. And uh, I said, my name is Michael. I'm a producer. I want to get to know you better. So she <laughs> said, my name is Camille. I said, good. Let me take you to lunch. She said, sure. Sweet, polite, gorgeous. So we set a time and a place. I have this uh, restaurant set up in one of the hotels. I figured she'd come up, I'll sweep her off her feet. You know, that was my attitude back then. And uh, I'm up there for about a half an hour. She stood me up. She never mm -hmm. showed up, right? <laughs> and so uh, I see her the next day on the set, and I said, hey, what happened? We had a date. You didn't show up. You know, I thought she was going to apologize and everything. She looked at me like, uh, did you really expect me to come? You know, she gave me one of those <laughs> looks, so she kind of put me on the defense right away. I gotta make a very long story short. Uh, I fell very much in love with this young girl. She's now my wife of uh, 35 years this year. And she was a, a young Christian girl. And um, She had a, a mom that prayed like crazy. Her, her mom, Irma, was the most godly woman I ever met in my life. You meet Irma for two minutes, your name goes into a prayer. She had a prayer book like a telephone book. I'm yeah. not kidding. And uh, I believe until today, Mel, that uh, my mother-in-law prayed me to where I am today. Yeah. Uh, she was such a, and she never hit me over the head with the Bible. It was just, she would talk to me as if Jesus was in the room. Mm -hmm. Her faith was just uh, so strong, such a simple woman. And um, what happened was, you know, th th this is the amazing thing. When I met her, I was at the top of my game. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, I beat, I had a bunch of cases. I was indicted five times. I had two federal racketeering cases, one brought on by Giuliani. Yeah. And after a seven-month trial, I was acquitted by, in, in court with Giuliani. Giuliani told me in a courtroom, if I convict you, you're going to get double what your father got. I'm going to give you 100 years. And that's the kind of time they would give them mob guys back then because I had a lot of publicity. And uh, so I beat all of these cases. And honestly, they were grooming me to be either the boss or the underboss. Uh, my, uh, the boss had a son. He and I came at the same age. We were going to take over the family. So um, I'm at the top of my game. I'm mob guy all the way. It was never, ever on my radar screen to ever walk away from that life. You don't even think about it. Yeah. It was not even a thought. But then I meet this young girl, and I start to fall in love with her. And for some reason, my love for her became more powerful than this lifelong bond I had for my dad. It became more powerful than this blood oath that I took to La Cosa Nostra. And, I, and now, after 35 years, I look back on my life, 
there's no doubt that God put this girl in my life. He yeah. had a different plan for me. And that's why I ask people all the time when I'm giving my testimony, I say, who did God put in your life? Yeah. You know, God is always trying to get our attention, Mel. Maybe through the people we know, maybe through a great joy in our life, maybe through an unpleasant experience. He doesn't go to the next church, the next town, the next house. He's always trying to get our attention. The idea is, are we paying attention? Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I knew that my life was a direct contradiction to everything these two women believe. And, you know, people, I get so much praise. Michael, nobody has ever walked away from that life publicly like you did. And I don't know anybody that has. Um, and they said, what a noble thing you did. And I said, there was no nobility in it at all. Mm -hmm. I left that, I betrayed my oath for selfish reasons. I wanted the girl, and I knew I couldn't have both. <laughs> yeah. You know? But, you know, um, sometimes I tell people, we, we walk parallel to God. Mm -hmm. Now, what do I mean by that? I married Camille, but I married her for me. I didn't marry her for God. Right. And I left that life, but I did that for me. I didn't do that for God. But I yeah. think what happened in my case, I'm walking down this path, and God is looking down and said, oh, okay, Mike, you married this girl. Good Christian girl. I put her in your life. You don't get it. One day you will. You know, oh, you left that life. Great. I can't do anything with you when you're running around the streets of New York committing crime. Right now, my son, you're walking parallel to me, but one day we're going to intersect. Yeah. And you know what you're going to realize? None of this was your plan. This was my plan for your life. Yeah. And when I look back, because I can't claim credit for this. I never thought I'd be sharing my testimony in church, and there was never even a thought. I got backed into this. Mm -hmm. I was almost like shamed into it because yeah. I felt, you know, my pastor who was so nice to me when I was in prison, I hardly knew him. He sent me commissary money. He sent me books to read. I used to tell my wife, why is this guy sending me things? I, I don't even know him. He married us, but I only met him twice. And she said, keep quiet. He loves the Lord, and turn, he loves you. Just take the books. I said, okay. <laughs> She's the boss, right? So when I come out, he says to me, you know, Mike, you got a great story. Will you give your testimony to our congregation? I said, testimony? I didn't even know what he was talking about. I thought you did that from a witness stand, right? <laughs> but uh, so I kind of backed into this, and then, you know, it, I, I, God just took it from there. And, so, so you and Cammie got married, and even when you got married, she didn't really understand the full extent of, you know, she had really even until you were sharing your testimony, and, and you know, I don't think she really understood the depth of some of the things you were involved in. No. So, so you guys get married. Um, after you're married, um, you're, you're, you have to serve a prison sentence. Um, you get out. You go back in because of parole violation. But uh, by this time, when you go back again and again, do you have two kids yeah. by then? You know, Mel, my wife was from Anaheim, California. Mm -hmm. She saw the Godfather once. She had no clue. And there's no mob out in L.A. We right. call them the Mickey Mouse guys out there. There's no real mob. <laughs> but uh, she had no clue of what really my life was all about. Yeah. You know, and until this very day, I have never sat down with my wife one-on-one -on -one and had a conversation about my former life. She doesn't want to know. Yeah. She, she's experienced enough. And I always tell people this. I'm really not the story here. My wife mm -hmm. is the story. Yeah. That girl, I brought so much baggage into her life that she didn't have a clue. And she, she'll tell you straight out, and I think you read her book. Mm -hmm. She loves me, but if God wasn't in the foundation of our marriage, she wouldn't have made it through. I mean, we, and, and her mother, my mother-in-law, I mean, just held her up. For some reason, she took a, a, a real love for me, and, and the woman was so great in my life. But, um... We got married in, in July of 85. She was 21. I go off to prison in December. Wow. I mean, I, we were hardly even married. Yeah. And uh, she just got hit with things left and right, left and right. And, um, you know, and I, I'm really thankful to the Lord because I love this woman. He's kept her in my life. And, you know, we have a, we have a great marriage. And we've had tremendous struggles and challenges because you don't, you don't come out of what I came out of without a lot of struggle. You know, my life was in danger. And... Uh, the FBI tried very hard to make a witness out of me and put me in a witness protection program, and I resisted that. And They gave me a very tough time in prison. They shipped me all over the country uh, trying to break me down. Um, I got, you know, five years of that. They, they kept me in lockdown because, of, you know, the, uh, they had word that my life was in danger, and we had a couple of attempts, and I get out on parole for 13 months, and it was, it was the worst 13 months of my life. I mean, it was so hard to get my act together. And they had told Camille, every time I walked out of the house, she was worried I wasn't going to come back because yep. they put a lot of fear in her. It was very hard, and like a fool, a, a real fool, uh, Mel, I fell into a trap, violated my parole, and they put me back in prison. 
And they told me at that point in time that they were going to indict me on, on new charges and that I'd never see the street again. Mm. And my wife had a breakdown at that point. We did have two little children, uh, babies, and, um, you know, she thought she'd never see me again. I thought I'd never get out again. And uh, they tried to indict me on a case. It fell apart. They couldn't, but they gave me four years, the maximum on a parole violation. And I spent uh, 35 more months in prison, 29 months and seven days in the hole. Wow. Six by eight cell, 24 seven, just me and God. And it was during, a, and I, I'll tell you this, Mel, I don't care who, who wants to put on any airs, that's difficult. Yeah. You know, I, I learned during that time that we weren't meant to be solo crew, we were meant to be social. Sure. And if it wasn't for the fact that I dove into my Bible and I had my wife send me in over 400 books on every faith, because, you know, I'm, I, am, I am honestly kind of a cynical guy. You grow up on the street, you question everything. And, you know, you don't trust a lot of things because by nature you, you can't be that trusting. Yeah. And um, when I, I had said, listen, God, I kind of challenged him. The night they locked me up, I thought my life was over. And I said, you know what, God, I trusted my father. I took a blood oath. Look where I am. I'm going to be in here for the rest of my life. If what my mother-in-law and my wife are telling me is true, if the Bible is your word and Jesus is my risen Savior, you got to prove it to me. i got to yeah. see the evidence. And for two and a half years, all I did was, on a daily basis, I read, I studied, I spent time with God. Um, and I came out of there believing with all my heart that the Bible was God's word and that Jesus was my risen Savior. And, and believe me, I really tested that. Like I said, I read up on every faith. I had nothing but time on my hands. And uh, when you have that time alone with the Holy Spirit, and, you know, and those lights go out at night, um, I had so many. I've never seen God in a vision. Don't get me wrong. He never spoke to me audibly. I don't have that gift. Yeah. But he just really spoke to my heart at my worst moments that I had. And he kept me strong. And there's no, there's no two ways about it. And I came out of there, and I had no clue what I was going to do. Yeah. I mean, where, am I, where do I start? You know, I'm out in California. Uh, you know, I'm away from what I know and the people I know, I'm almost in hiding. I had to be careful of every, everything I did. Uh, and God just took it from there. Um, so a lot of people that are here in the room or maybe people that are watching online right now, um, they look at your life and they go, man, I can't, I can't even um, relate to that. You know, I can't relate to what you were involved in. Because a lot of us, we go, man, I'm, I'm not a great person, but I've never done that stuff, you know. And so there might be people that are watching going, man, um, you know, I, I know that I'm probably not where I need to be with God, but I know I'm not as bad as that guy mm -hmm. was. Um, tell me, what, what do you think was the biggest thing that shifted in your life after you came out? Uh, I mean, obviously, you're walking with Christ and, you know, you're a new creation in him. But what was the thing that really changed that you went, man, this is dramatically different than it was before, than my life was before? Well, just the whole, I mean, look, I, I can't explain how difficult it was, number one, for me to walk away from that life mm -hmm. because I felt like I was betraying my oath. I was betraying my father. You know, this is really, in, I mean, this is who you are, body, yeah. mind, and soul. You're, in, you're part of that life. I grew up in it, and uh, I labored and labored and labored, and this time that I would beat myself up and and then just gradually, as the Lord worked on me, I believe, and I, you don't realize it's the Lord working on you, but in reality it is yeah. when you see the end result. Um, I think what really changed is when I started to share my testimony with people and I saw the impact. Mm. And, you know, when I first started, Mel, I was just telling a story. I didn't realize it. But then as you mature in that life and the Holy Spirit, look, I never had, um, I never had an experience where, I had vision of the Lord or whatever. My, my closest uh, relationship with the Holy Spirit is when I'm on stage mm -hmm. because I know that he puts words in my mouth that are for the people out there. Because I always tell people, when we're up on stage, it's not about us. Yeah. Okay? It's about how God is using us to get to the people out of there that need to hear him. And, and yeah. you know that, Mel. Yeah. We're vehicles. That yeah. We're messengers. And, and he has put so many things. And I feel the closest to the Spirit when I'm right here on stage sharing my testimony. So when I saw the impact that it was having, yeah. um, I said, this must be what you want me to do, Lord. Yeah. And it, it was life-changing for me in mm. that regard because then I became committed. It took time. Yeah. You know, at first I was saying, oh, 
You know, I, t- I confided in a friend of mine. I said to him, when I first started coming up to speak, I confided in him. I said, this just don't feel right. You know, the name Michael Francis next to ministry, eh, it's not working <laughs> for me, right? So I confided in him, and I said, hey, you know, who's going to listen to me? I said, you know, my background, if I was in the audience, I wouldn't listen to me, you know? Who's gonna... And he looked at me, and I thought he was really going to console me, and he said, Francis, stop being a wimp. And I said, hey, now, take it easy. Don't forget who you're talking to here, right? I got, a little, I got a little insulted with him. I said, hey, what do you mean by that? I'm, I'm confiding in you, and you talk to me like that. And he said to me, you're insulting me right now. Hmm. And I said, how am I insulting you? What does this have to do with you? And he said, I'll never forget, Mel. He said, my Lord and Savior died a horrible death. He was scourged. He was spat upon. He was ridiculed. He was, he was shamed, everything. And he was hung to a cross. And he did it for the forgiveness of all sins. Mm. And you're telling me you're too much of a big shot, didn't work for you? That's so good. You know, when he said it to me like that, you know, and then it really sunk in when I had, I was so blessed to visit Jerusalem and walk where Jesus walked. And it really hit me at that point that he really did die for all of us. And, you know, I say this, look, I tell people all the time, I was pretty good on the street. I'm going to be honest with you. And, you know, I could probably pull the wool over a bunch of your eyes. You could walk out here and say, wow, this guy, great story and everything else. And I could be the biggest hypocrite in the world. But I know one thing. I can't pull a scam on God. Yeah. He knows our hearts. And I have a very healthy fear of hell. I spent three, almost three years in the hole, solitary. That was my hell. I don't want any part of that. Yeah. I want to be with the Lord in heaven one day. And I, I just pray. I always pray to God. You know, let me do this for the right reason, and if it's for the wrong reason, take it away from me, because um, I, I don't want to play that game. That's a dangerous game. And, um, and you know, he's, he's honored that. We've had our ups and downs. We've had a lot of challenges. But I will tell you this, people. The reason I'm always up here, and I want to say this, and I know Pastor will allow me to, there was a point in time when there was no doubt about it. I was the worst person in the room. I spent 20 years every day knowing and willingly as a sinner. And I'm going to be honest, there was times when I was told to do things that I was very uncomfortable to do. I really was. But you know what? I did it anyway. And there's no excuse, because you could always say no. If there's consequences, well, then you suffer. I did it anyway. And if God can forgive me, and not only forgive me, but he gave me my life, he gave me my freedom, he gave me a wife that I adore, children that I love. I have seven kids. I got six grandchildren, a ministry that I never asked for. Um, through all the tough times, he has blessed me um, because I was very fortunate to surround myself with the right people. And, and people, make no mistake, in this world, we are who we hang out with. Yeah. We hang with the wrong people. They will influence us, and you'll go in the wrong direction. Listen, when I came to the Lord, I didn't get a lobotomy. I don't forget the 20 years I put on the street. When I was still, th- I'll be honest with you, every time I go to a gas station, I pump gas in my car, it drives me crazy because I used to make all that money with gas. <laughs> so, you know, um, but if God can do all of this for me, I always say, people, what do you worry about? Yeah, and I mean, it, nobody is beyond the reach of our Lord, and he's there. You know, Jesus said it so many times, I didn't come here to help the the, the healthy, I came here to help the sick. His yeah. arms are open all the time, and we need to understand that. And we have a, a very merciful, loving, and forgiving God. That's good. Um, Michael is going to be available out in the lobby uh, following our worship experience today. Um, you've got uh, several books with you, uh, some other resources, and uh... yeah. And and I want I want to well I want to say this. By the way, this book uh, comes out on Monday. <laughs> so. Okay. This is the first time we've sold it here. It comes out on Monday. But if you read the inside, guys, you want to read a mob story, it's a mob story. I don't sugarcoat anything. Ladies, it's a love story, a story about me and my wife and how we come (laughs) to visit. But um, it's really a story about how God can change a life. But read the inside cover of the book. I want you to know how significant God has worked in my life, and then I want to apply it to your own, no matter what you've done. The inside cover, when I walked out of prison in 95, everybody predicted my death. Life magazine, quote, inside cover, if he holds to what he has promised, will mark the first time a high-ranking member of the mafia will publicly walk away from his past and live. Ed McDonald was the head of the organized crime strike force. I walk out of prison, he gets on national TV, and he says, quote, I wouldn't be, I wanna be in Michael Francis' shoes. I don't think his life expectancy is very substantial. That was in 95. 
Ed McDonald, I mean, uh, uh, Bernie Welsh, the FBI agent, followed him to the podium. He wasn't diplomatic. He said straight out, Franzis will get whacked. I think you know what that means in street terms. And my mother, God rest her soul, she said, I pray for my son every night. She was so worried about me, knowing what I did and living with my father. That was in 95. 1975, I walk in a room, five guys all murdered. I'm sitting here talking to you. And the last thing I want you to show, the power of the Lord in anybody's life. You saw that Fortune magazine article. It was written in 86. 50 biggest and most powerful mob bosses in the country. It was a huge article. They featured six of us. I was one of the six. And they actually had a chart with the 50 of us on there according to wealth and power and rank. I was number 18, youngest guy on the list, five behind my friend John Gotti at the time. And people, don't ask me how they make a list like that. They didn't ask for our tax returns. It was all, it was, it was all silly. They sold a lot of magazines. But you know what isn't silly about that life? About that list, rather? Today, some 35 years, 36 years later, out of the list of 50, 47 of those men are dead. Two of them are doing life in prison without parole, and number 50 is here, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ with you. Yeah. What does that tell you? Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, Michael, thank you very much. I'm going to let Michael slip on out to the lobby, and uh, can we give him another round of applause as he heads that thank way? You. No, thank, thank you, Michael. You. Appreciate, Appreciate it. it. Thank you. You know, guys, one of the things Michael talked about was the life. And uh, I couldn't help but think of this passage of scripture. It's from John chapter 14, verse 6. And Jesus says this. He says, um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And for so many of us, we try to find life in so many places. Um, you know, for Michael, he thought he'd found everything he was looking for when he found his associations in the, in the mafia, in the mob. Um, he thought he'd found the life, but truly the only place we can really find life is in Jesus Christ. And uh, he shared that so eloquently tonight. And if you're here tonight and you say, Mel, you know what? I just came to hear a story. I just came to hear somebody's testimony. Um, and uh, maybe you weren't even prepared to uh, hear about the Jesus that Michael serves and the, the Jesus that we worship. That's okay. Jesus has been planning to meet you here since the beginning of time. He has put you on a crash course, a, a collision course with your soul. And he wants to meet with you tonight. And so I want to ask every person in this place to bow your head and close your eyes. And if you're here tonight and you say, Mel, you know what? I'm not really serving God. I'm not in relationship with Jesus, but I know I need to be. If tonight you want to make him Lord of your life, we're not going to embarrass you or bring you forward. We just want to pray with you right where you're at. So if, if that's you, you say, Mel, I'd like to pray tonight to receive Jesus, to, to make him Lord of my life. Would you be bold enough just to slip your hand up real high where I can see it? You can put it right back down. Thank you. I see you over here on my right. Yeah, thank you guys. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Yeah, up in the balcony, I see you. Praise God. Thanks, over here on my left. Yeah, thank you. I see you. Praise the Lord. Who else? Just a few more seconds. Anyone else? I'd like every person in this place to pray this prayer with me. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. And thank you for paying for my sins with your life on the cross. From this day forward, I give you my life. Use it for your glory. I'm never going to turn away from you and your plans for me. Thank you for loving me. And thank you for choosing me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's give God a round of applause tonight. Now listen. Just like Michael had to take an oath, a blood oath to the, to the mob, tonight you just got to make an oath to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and say, hey, my life is yours. Whatever you want to do with my life, you take it. See, Michael was betrayed by the mob. He was betrayed by his family. His dad actually put a hit out on his own life. But our Heavenly Father is not like that. Our Heavenly Father will guard you, protect you. He'll guide you. So we want to help you take the next step. If you prayed that prayer tonight and you meant it, uh, there's a, a card in the seat back in front of you that says, need prayer. The other side says salvation. If you would take that card, fill it out, and then drop it in one of our offering boxes as you leave. We're going to help you take the next step in this thing of ours, in the life that we're talking about here in Christ. Um, 
If you're watching online or maybe you're here in the room and can't reach a card, simply text the word salvation to the number 555-888. We're going to respond back to you, help you take the next step in your faith journey. Uh, we'll get you plugged into opportunities, relationships, baptisms, everything you need to grow in your faith. We're going to help you do that. So this is what we're going to do now. These guys are going to lead us in one final song. And then in just a moment, I'll come back up and dismiss us. But in the meantime, our prayer team's available on either side of the stage to pray with you. If you have a prayer need at all, step out as we begin to sing and let them pray with you and agree with you in prayer. And like I said, in just a moment, I'll come close this out. So stand to your feet all over the room. We're going to worship together one more time before we go.